Hello, hello. I bet you can hear me on that mic, but it's super noisy. So let me flip over to, let me just restart the spark. But you can hear this, I believe. So let me turn this down so we can cut some of the little noise. Is that better, folks? Can you hear me better? And is the wind noise too much, or is that all right? Mostly hearing wind. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what if I unplug that? And then give me one more second. Let's take one more shot at this. So it looks like the mic volume was turned down. That was the whole problem. All right. Y'all can probably hear me much better now. Hopefully not too loud. Is it too hot or are we doing okay? All right, I can turn it up a little more. Better, very good now. Awesome, all right. We have snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Let's keep going here. Sorry about that. Uh, let me hide this part. Oop. And now we're back into it. So, welcome. Good to see you all. <laughs> you know, it's it's this it's I was actually just talking to a friend Paul Zagrowski earlier about this because it was like one of those challenges where I, I realized that like, you know, in every operating system for some reason I don't think we've really solved sound and that sort of thing. It's always there's always something funky happening somewhere. That's kind of weird. Anyway, good to see you all. So thank you very much for letting me know that audio was not working and that it's working now. So I started off by basically saying that, like, you know, I, I was really looking forward to seeing Joe do this episode, but he unfortunately got pulled into some other highly important businessy thing. And so it's <coughs> you're, you're, you're stuck with me again this week. So we're going to explore the uh, we're going to explore crew and cube kettle plugins and we're going to get into that kind of thing. So let me go back to my hellos. Good to see you all Suresh, Lamati, Rory, Abhishek and Ahmet. Good to thank you very much for being here. We got Martin and Enver. We got Rajaram and Dinesh and Vivian telling me I'm muted. A bunch of people telling me I'm muted. Thank you so much for the feedback. It really helps. Um, I think we've got it all figured out now though. So that's good. Um, yeah, the laptop speaker without the without the sock is probably way too windy. Mr. Joe Searcy saying hello, and Ed saying the sound is cutting in and out. That was probably the issue. Looks like we're all in good shape now, though. And Grigor saying uh, thank you for all the TGIK series. Uh, TGI series. I, I really appreciate doing them. It's like it's a super fun thing, super fun part of my week, and it's awesome, you know, just to be a part of this community and like give back some of that. So that's awesome. And Federico from saying hello from Sweden. And Bogdan saying hello from Bucharest and Marco. Hey Marco, good to see you. And he's in Belgrade. All right, <coughs> let's get to the third screen, which should be the screen and the cam. So let's make sure that's working. Boop, and it is. All right, cool. So this week we're going to do Cube Kettle plugins and crew. This is episode 118. If you want to participate in the uh, in the chat in the um, in the notes, you can find it online at tgik.io/notes, just like always. 
Let's take a look at what's happening in the space. We're still on 119 Alpha 3, no new changes to report this week. Enhancement freeze is next week, so if you're trying to get something in to core Kubernetes, next week is the freeze for that. This week in community, we have a few updates, which will be pretty exciting. We've got Harbor 2.0 taking a giant leap in expanding supported artifacts with OCI support, meaning that we can support more than just Docker containers. Pretty exciting stuff. It's an OCI compliant registry now. So if you're interested in Harbor or playing with it or checking it out, there's some pretty exciting stuff happening in the space. You can now actually host Helm charts um, via Helm 3. We're shipping, oh cool, I remember this actually started as a tweet. Uh, Harbor and Aqua and Aqua Trivia working together, I think. I think this actually, this project started as a tweet, if I remember correctly, could be wrong, but I think that's where it comes from. So this is now using Aqua's Trivi scanner piece, um, and that's pretty exciting. Then we look at the up path, upgrade path from one to one X to two X. I, ha I certainly haven't, I know that it's, I suspect that it's possible. Um, big community shout-outs to Luke Perkins for the new snazzy Go Harbor website. we got a bunch of other folks, Depend Liu and All for Nothing, Hugh, a bunch of other folks in the community really helping out with the project. This is a CNCF hosted project, so it's really great to see the community engaging on it. Other notable features, what do we got? Oh, now we have a, a dark mode, because, you know, dark modes are nice. So check out the dark mode in the Harbor UI. That's pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, I think that's an enterprise feature nowadays. You know, you have to have dark mode. Thank you all. Hello from India. Audio too low. Still audio too low? I thought I had fixed that up. Let me trim this up a little more. Can't hear clearly. Mm. Everybody else sounding okay? Check it check. Is everybody all right? I can turn this up a little more here. How about that? Is that any better? All right, cool. Just let me know if I'm coming in too hot. All right. Great article from Mr. Alex Ellis, one of the one of the awesome, one of the awesome folks in our community. He wrote up a bare metal in a cloud native world. <clears throat> Pretty good article describing like what do you think of when you think of bare metal and like some of the work that he's done. He's actually written a bunch of stuff on actually leveraging um, Raspberry Pis. So if you're interested in Raspberry Pis and, and that sort of work, definitely check out um, Alex Ellis' stuff. He also works on OpenFAS and a bunch of other kind of crazy stuff. So really cool stuff. Talks about functions as a service and talks about the serverless project. Um, kind of describing some of the general terms that we unfortunate operators think about when in terms of bare metal um, describing some of the components that we have to deal with on a daily basis pretty cool stuff talks about nutbooting so yeah if you're interested in bare metal and that whole space check that out there's actually another project that i've been starting to explore in the bare metal space that might be worth checking out also if you're interested in it um tinkerbell.org i was actually thinking about doing um a TGIK, a TGIK episode on this as well, but T, uh, Tinkerbell is a set of, of services that can be used as a um, <coughs> as an API-driven provider for bare metal machines, right? And so I, I was thinking about setting up something like this using like a, a, a VirtualBox or vSphere uh, workstation environment in which I can actually have these uh, virtual machines like just booting off of the network and then using Tinkerbell to kind of explore that stuff. So. That's definitely one of the things I'm very interested in checking out. If that's something that's interesting to you, just let me know in the chat. Michael Lerner has written up Understanding Raft Consensus. We talked a little bit about Raft in the etcd episode this last time. We kind of explored how it works a little bit. Um, but this seems like a pretty good collection of information around Raft and how it works. So. If you're interested in understanding a little more about it, this I don't think gets into the detail of how etcd itself implements it, but it is an understanding of the ref, of the Raft consensus algorithm and how it works. So definitely check that out if you're interested in it. Let's see, Anders Boris writes up how I switched from classic hosting to Kubernetes. If you're interested in a quick how-to on setting up Kubernetes, Nginx, Certbox, and Load Balancer, then, then skip to making the switch. He's written up effectively a 
diagram of where he, or uh, an article describing how he went from, he hosts all of his stuff on DigitalOcean. I used to have a few instances running Docker Swarm. And then basically he kind of explores how he made the jump to Kubernetes. So looks pretty cool. Again, all on DigitalOcean. So describes the cert manager stuff. Talks about the different templates for what he's doing. He's written up a retrospective on it. Pretty good article, you know, kind of describing like how you can get from one to the other. So this might work for some people, kind of exploring the different method, um, a different method for how you can actually make a jump from uh, your existing hosting solution to this one. CD Cates, what is CD Cates.io? CDK for Kubernetes. Define Kubernetes apps and components using familiar languages. The cloud development kit. Why would you use CDK? Harness for, I don't actually know what this one is. Works for Kubernetes everywhere. You can use CDKs to define any application for any Kubernetes cluster running anywhere, including cloud or on-premise. It's like saying, has language support. What are we looking at here? What does it do? It's from AWS Labs. Anybody have an idea? Have we looked at uh, CDKs? What are we looking at here? A software development framework for defining Kubernetes applications and reusable abstractions using familiar programming languages. Ah, I think I do remember hearing about this. This is the, the root of each tree. In the, uh, is the app. This might be an interesting episode all on its own. There's a blog talking about the Cloud Development Kit, and they have a CNCF seminar. So they're building out tooling that allows you to describe pods and services and first-class Kubernetes objects uh, and other objects within the world. So here's an example of a basic Kubernetes object written in TypeScript. So importing the deployment object and then defining this stuff as code. So this, I mean, it'd be interesting. I imagine this is something of a competitor to folks like Pulumi and uh, some of the stuff that Terraform is working on lately. Like those folks, I imagine, probably view this as a comp as competition. It is interesting, and I haven't really explored it, but like it might be worth kind of checking out. What do we have happening in the chat? I hope you all can hear me okay. So for CDK8, you can check out the webinar in the C Yeah, exactly. There is a link to the, sub the, the webinar in from their webpage. Yep, standardized way, or basically using code. I mean, infrastructure as code. Everybody's really, obviously, really interested in writing or seeing more infrastructure as code. And so it's interesting to see, like, more kind of runs on that, you know, like more attempts at defining some of the or providing an abstraction in front of things like Kubernetes or some of the other um, IaaS providers that you work with uh, and how we can kind of build that stuff as code. So having an application that becomes like self-aware and that kind of thing or being able to manage. Uh, I mean, in, in some ways you could think of uh, uh, most of the operator pattern as, as, as a technique of exploring the same stuff, right? So it'd be something, of, some, something to related to that. We got... If you can, if you want, I can share. Yeah, go ahead and share the link, and I can go ahead and approve it from over here. Otherwise, you can put the link in the notes, tgik.io/notes. The next article up, we have what is this article? How to automatically detect and deal with deprecated APIs. Now, y'all have heard me rant about this. In fact, I had a whole episode about deprecated APIs. They're talking about some of the tools. They've got a new tool called kubeint. Install kubeint. Configure kubekettle's current content. Hey, this is like a plugin. Oh, actually, it's not a plugin. Well, maybe it is, but we'll, we'll explore it anyway. Uh, 
Cubent will connect your cluster, retrieve all resources that might be affected, scan and print a summary of those. You can also output it to JSON. I guess Cubent stands for Cube No Trouble. I see. Yeah. This is actually a very good point. So what they're describing is you may want to know that there is a resource that you've deployed into your Kubernetes cluster that at deploy time was defined at a previous version. Um, and this is really useful if you're doing things like migrating from 116 to 117 and you want to make sure that all of your source manifests are able to make that jump, right? And the way that you can detect that, um, in some cases, not in every case, uh, in some cases you can detect that by looking at the stored, the stored configuration when uh, when when a resource is deployed inside of your cluster, right? And so, like if we do, um, this is a very good point. Cluster. So let's bring up a cluster real quick, and I'll show you what I'm, I'll show you kind of what I'm talking about here. It's actually some interesting changes in the 118 um, resource piece, anyway. But while that's happening, let's keep reading. So basically, they're just basically they're trying to find a way to like expose some of the some of the um, configuration that's happened inside of your existing cluster. I think I pointed this out before, but if I haven't, another one that's really good for this is uh, Pluto from Fairwinds Ops. And this was, uh, I think we talked about this one in the last episode, but Pluto is another one of the tools that is actually out there that can help you uh, understand um, whether the resources that you have on disk before you apply them to the cluster are actually using deprecated versions or not. And so like having something in this like this in your pipeline, I think is pretty critical to um, really making good use of Kubernetes. This one, however, won't, I don't think it, I mean, I guess it does do a Helm detection in cluster, so it is gonna look, it's gonna try and introspect some things inside the cluster to understand whether those resources were defined already out of date or out, or out of spec. And then it will also give you the ability to run it as a pipeline. So pretty interesting stuff. I guess these are competing projects. Again, so many awesome things. K9S is really awesome, yeah. KubeKettle is also one of my favorite ones. KubeKettle deprecations plugin. Oh, neat. We'll check that one out. Um, Jetstack and Venify forces to bring, join forces to bring machine identity protection to the cloud native stack. So I was actually just talking to Mr. James Munley, who's a, a good friend in the community. And I was telling him, congrats, this seems like it has to be just a huge validation of all of the work that you and the community have put into things like Cert Manager. Um, so to see Benefy acquiring Jetstack is awesome. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like it's a really good situation for everybody. So congrats all around. It was started by Christian Simon, our first employee. That was Cube Lego. I remember Cube Lego. Cube Lego came before Q Cert Manager. Yeah, Cert Manager success, driven and pioneered by James Munley, who I think was also involved in the in the in Cube Lego at that time. So yeah, if you want a little more history about what's happening there and what they're going to do, definitely check out the Get to Jetstack blog. But super exciting to hear that that happened. I mean, and, it, and it's just great to see like validation of some of the um, some of the new like PKI and TLS models that are emerging from this whole Kubernetes world, like the ability to. You know, like obviously inside of Kubernetes, especially as we're defining new web services and we're defining new services that have other requirements for certificates, being able to have tooling like Cert Manager is pretty critical to really like um, to, to reducing the friction around uh, PKI and TLS in general, right? I mean, and, and it's, you know, just can't say enough about the work that Cert Manager has done to like really further that, like whether upstream um, like Cert Manager is used as part of the way that Cluster API actually defines resources. Um, it's just an incredible tool. So if that's something that you're interested in, I hope that I hope that you'll check out the blog. And I just want to say congrats one more time to everybody in that community and uh, all of the work that they've done. It seems just tremendous. 
The next one up on our list is from Mr. Brad Deesman. <coughs> and he is has written a kubectl plugin. So let's kind of talk about this and play with it a little bit. So and then we're gonna um, and then we're gonna get into like some of the other pieces here. So in the chat we have a bunch of different plugins that we're gonna explore. We're probably gonna play with a few of these things and kind of explore how they work. We can look at um, crew.sigs.io. We can look at this presentation. This is a great reference link, actually, Ahmet, who's part of our chat today, did a great presentation. I'm not sure where you presented this, Ahmet, but it, I just actually drifted through the presentation and it looks really solid uh, about effectively like why, um, about making kubectl plugins mainstream. And he really highlights all of the highlight, uh, all of the high points about exactly why um, uh, kubectl plugins make so much sense and why and why we see such a, a, a lift into what into what's happening in that space. So if you're interested in that, ah, oh, in San Diego, I somehow missed that one. <coughs> um, but definitely check it out. And then he also has a few links to kubectl plugin. So like some naming guide, a practicing uh, the uh, best practices for developing one, and and for de and plugin development itself. We're going to kind of explore those things, and then interesting issues to uh, follow are custom plugin indexes. I don't know what that one's going to be, but let's get into this one because first I kind of want to highlight this kind of what I think is a pretty important point, right? Which is that um, the way kubectl plugins work in general, and this has nothing to do with crew. This has nothing to do with like. The work that Ahmet has done with Crew or any of that stuff, um, but just kind of a caveat mTOR around plugins in general. Like this is the thing that I really want to make sure that uh, folks understand about this. This is one of those things that uh, bugged me. Oh, but now we have our cluster up. So let's do this. Let's do kubectl create deployment test image. Whoop. All right. Did not save the annotation. Yes, I can. So in here in the annotations, usually there is a place where it stores the previous configuration of the deployment. But for some reason that's not triggering for me and I'm not sure exactly why. So let's do kubectl edit deployment test. I think that there is a way to kind of tell it specifically that we want to save the output record. So that describes the change, but usually there's like a blob up here that actually describes the previous Deployment to ah, that's maybe that's sort of it. You get all edit deployment test, and then we go down to the actual uh, template spec because this will actually force it to change. Bar. Nope. Oh, it's weird. Can't get it to actually apply. Oh, okay. Create deployment dash and uh, test. Manage equals case.tcr.io pause dash oem. 
boy. And you were correct. It was apply because it's a applied configuration, not a created configuration. Sorry, that was my bad. So inside here, um, typically if you're applying resources, uh, you can actually see the way that that was defined at that time. So like in our case, we can see that it was a kind deployment and we can see that the API version of this resource, when it was defined, when it was put into the cluster as apps v1, or actually, you know, when it was applied by kubectl, it was apps v1. So this is one of the resources that tooling like that can actually look at to validate um, whether the thing defined inside the cluster originated from a from an unsupported version or an, an, an unsupported uh, uh, unsupported. Sorry. This is a way that we can define whether we can a uh, way that we can determine if when the resource was applied, if it associate if it was associated with an API. Um, version or group that has been deprecated because we'll be able to see the stored um, configuration for that resource. Inside of etcd we don't keep any information about this other than this field, right? So as you define these things, say we bring up a 116 cluster and we define a resource and then we upgrade that cluster to 118 or 117 and then 118. Um, when we look at the way those resources are stored, they're going to be stored exactly the same way. And it wouldn't matter at all that, they, that, <coughs> that we upgraded through it. And the only record we would have that that resource was created under a deprecated API group would, would, be, this, would be this field. It doesn't actually keep that record in the way that it's stored. The garden is pretty awesome. I have a great backyard and I'm really, I'm really grateful to have it. So that was one of the things I wanted to show you. So like, if you have wondered how tooling like that is able to introspect resources defined inside your cluster and understand that those resources were created with a previous version uh, or a pre previous API version or maybe a deprecated API version, this is really the only tool at your disposal to determine that. Um, so kind of interesting stuff. Delete. Deployment test. All right, so I think I have. Yeah. <coughs> Which kubectl honk. So there's actually some interesting stuff that happens here. So I'm going to go ahead and blow this away because I think it's a, a previous version that I don't want to run here on this. curl minus lo get io kubectl honk so the way that kubectl plugins work today this wasn't the way that it always worked it used to work where you actually where we had a defined uh, subdirectory where things would where all of the kubectl plugins would sit and then as long as your binary or whatever the plugin was was located in that directory then we'd be able to we would be able to uh, uh, discover it and use it as part of the kubectl um, argument path, right? But <coughs> today that's changed. Today, uh, today, um, and it's actually been through, I think, of since 116 or 115. Ahmet can probably keep me honest here, but there, when this change happened, we basically started following a different pattern in which as long as a binary is in your path and it starts with kubectl dash and then whatever your plugin is, then it is discoverable, right? So, um, <coughs> And that's actually part that's built into kubectl as it is today, right? So we've just downloaded a plugin, and let's take a look at that plugin. It's called kubectl honk, um, and this is a simple little bash script, right? And inside of the bash script, it's gonna it's gonna echo version if you ask for version, and then it's gonna show that it has access to things on your system in your home directory. So let's give this a try real quick. It looks like kubectl honk isn't in my path, right? But if I do, uh, if I have, I think I have bin in my path. Let's move my kubectl honk that I just downloaded into this bin and we'll make it executable. So now, 
although it won't show up in the uh, in the auto detect, right? It won't show up in the tab completion. I can actually do cube kettle honk. And if I wanted to, I could also um, just put the dash in as well because it's still in my path, right? So this is going to be true of the way that plugins work in general. As long as you've got, as long as the, the, the binary itself is accessible inside of your path, like you can actually discover um, anything called kubectl dash x, and then those things will work. Now, one thing I do want to, there's two parts I want to like really make sure that we have an understanding on. One is that like, as this thing points out, right? Any binary that you're running would have access to anything else on your system. It's not jailed or, or uh, isolated. This isn't running inside of a container. Um, it doesn't have its own file system that is secured from your existing file system. These plugins are actually um, uh, fully fledged processes in your in your in the system where your where your cube kettle is running, right? So if you have cube kettle running here, this means that anything accessible to you from where cube kettle is running is also accessible to the plugin. And this is important because it means caveat emptor. You know, if you're going to download and play with a plugin, be aware that that plugin can uh, has access to resources perhaps a little more than you might expect. Now, I'm totally like. Uh, I, I prefer a world of trust, right? Like, I mean, like, I think we all trust each other, but definitely be aware of that. I don't feel sick. Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, Brad is a, you know, Brad, Brad is a wily individual. If you haven't had a chance to check out the recent, um, the recent talk that Brad and Ian did at RSA, I definitely recommend checking that out. It's a, it was a, per, it was a really good talk and I very, very much enjoyed it. But, so this is your note from the security goose and, um, honk as they say all right so that was one point that i wanted to make clear real quick what else do we have so let's go back to our list here and get into some of the fun stuff so we got a few um, recommendations for plugins to check out and i think that we should kind of work through some of these things and see how they work and play with them um as i said before the the talk that um Amit did on the, oh, dang it, hold on. This talk here, I'm just gonna shoot through it real quick and highlight kind of what I think are the important points, but um, definitely check it out if this is something you're interested in. Um, but it basically talks about the like, kettle plugin that we've already covered. Um, <clears throat> we talked about basically this, right? An executable program, name it kubectl something, put it in your path. Ah, just remembered, okay. So one of the questions I had uh, on this security topic before we go down the path any farther, right? It's like obviously built in to kubectl are arguments, things like kubectl config, right? So I can do kubectl config view and dash dash minify, and this will show me the uh, the uh, redacted version of my um, cube config. So you can share that and like show show how it configs. And if you wanted to see the whole thing. If you do flatten, it will show you the encoded certs and everything, and this becomes a thing that you can export and use in, a, in other places. But this is just a simple kind config. So one of the questions I had, and maybe that you have, is, well, what if I wanted, what if uh, my attacker was feeling clever and they wanted to basically wrap the config command to, to do other stuff? Like, um, what if I renamed this from kubectl honk to kubectl config? What would happen? Right? Like what happens if I, what happens if I do that? What do you all think is going to happen? Anybody know? Anybody have a guess? What's going to, I mean, I, ima I imagine Ahmed knows. Can't shadow built-ins. Exactly. So if I do keep kettle config again, it will fail. Um, or it won't, it won't fire. I can do keep kettle dash config because it's still in my path. Right, but kubectl config itself, because it's a built-in command, um, that has precedence over anything that it's discovered. Um, so that's the, I think the the killer the killer feature here. <clears throat> Brad, if you want to put the link into the chat or into the, um, you know, the uh, the notes, that's probably the way to go. So yeah, exactly. So I think that that's actually you know uh, an. 
a, a good thing security wise because obviously you can think of some some pretty interesting ways that that might get interesting uh, and so you can't shut a built-in so that's a good thing let's explore the next part of this now remember uh, also um, remember that your pa your your path is a, is set by you right so if I do echo path I can see that my entire path is here, is is defined uh, by me and also I have some included system paths that you know came as part of my system came as part of my uh, setup but more importantly I actually have a dot local bin and I have bin and this means that I have control over what plugins are being um, are, are discoverable by me, right? So let's go back to this piece and we'll keep going here. So where do I find plugins? GitHub, some list, package manager. This is where we get to the fun part, Crew. So Crew is a project that Mr. <coughs> Ahmet put together and it started, I think this was your, your work from the beginning, wasn't it, Ahmet? <coughs> but, but basically to give some tooling that will allow you to discover, install, update, and remove plugins. This was started in 2018, and it was donated to Kubernetes Project in May 2019. And you can find it today, crew.sigs.case.io, is that right? Yeah. So today it's actually as part of, it's a, it's part of the sigs.case.io uh, repo, and so inside of, if you go to sigs.case.io, it's basically a kind of a vanity URL for a sub project within um, the Kubernetes uh, ownership pace, right? So here's, <coughs> actually this is a different org. So you have the Kubernetes org and you have the Kubernetes SIGs org. And underneath the Kubernetes SIGs org, that's where we have things like Kind, things like uh, Minikube, thing Customize, other stuff that has been specific, that, that is very specific to Kubernetes, but is actually um, still looking for a contribution from the community that is owned and I mean, and it is, and it is uh, contributed directly to that, uh, to the community itself, right? So cluster API, um, the cluster add-ons repo, kind, like I said, kind is in here. There's a bunch of other interesting stuff. Some of the cube ped stuff, the descheduler, all these things are inside of the uh, Kubernetes SIGs org. And generally when you're, uh, when you're applying for membership to the Kubernetes org, you would actually get access to both of these GitHub orgs, Kubernetes and Kubernetes SIGs. So what is crew? It kind of talks about what it is. It talks about the uh, user guide. There's a quick start. Let's play with the quick start and let's play with this thing. So let's go ahead and get this started. Let's do an install of crew here. I don't think I have it already installed. Kubectl crew. I don't. All right, so let's get this started here. So run this command, make sure the git is installed. What is this command? We're gonna make a temp directory. We're gonna drop the latest download and YAML file. We're gonna make sure the case, we're gonna fix up the capitalization, which is weird. I don't know why that would have to be done. And then we have a crew install of a manifest, which presumably is that YAML file. Let's go take a look at that and see what we see. Yeah, I know I missed the D. Don't tell me. I know. Mm, all right. Crew. So as part of a release, it looks like we have a tarball, which Presumably include some of the assets for crew for other operating systems. We have uh, a binary for Windows, and then we have this crew.yaml. Let's take a look at that file and see what it says. So this is crew.containertools.github.org for the org for the API version telling us what version it is. This is probably how we actually track what version of crew to install. Ah, okay, so this way you could actually do kubectl crew update. This is probably wiring that part of it in. Okay, that makes sense. 
let's continue with our install. Making a temp directory, grabbing the stuffs, telling me to put the following into my bash or bash RC. And then presumably that's because uh, this is because this is where crew is actually going to store the plugins that you get and update through crew. So let's go ahead and do that part. But the way I'm going to do this is a little different than the way it describes. So I'm just going to chuck it into my NVRC for this for now. Okay, so then we can do go path, grab crew, and we see it there. So cool. So we got that part in there. And presumably now we have cube kettle crew. And we do. Looks like it's I'm able to call it individually. And also as part of regular Killer crew. So let's flip back over to the terminal where it makes a little bit more sense to see. Crew installs itself as a plugin, has crew itself hosted. So let's take a look inside that directory that we, oh, we saw. And there's the plugin, and there's the version. All right, cool. So we do crew update, or I see, kubectl, crew, whoa, oh I see, be kind of interesting to see how bash completion could work for that, I'm not sure how that would actually function, I guess you'd have to do it, you'd have to pick up this part, I don't know how to make bash completion like uh, polymorphic like that, but Anyway, so if we do kubectl, we did kubectl crew list, we can see the only plugin we have installed is the one that Amit was just pointing out. Yeah, I know, that's got to be tricky. Um, <coughs> we have the crew plugin. So let's look for one of the first plugins that we saw in the notes here. And... For that one, let's do get all. I'm actually curious about our, our back view and get all. I think I know what it, get all is about. So, get all. <coughs> and this is actually a pretty interesting uh, exposed way of doing it. So, if we were to do kubectl crew install get all. We should be pulling that stuff down. So it says, you installed plugin get all from the crew index plugin repository. These plugins are not audited for security by the crew maintainers. Run them at your own risk. Caveat emptor, as we had already said. I love that that's actually a part of the crew output though. So that's actually really solid. I'm, gonna, I'm glad you're doing that because I, I, I think that it's pretty easy to get missed. Um, to use this plugin, it gives you the command to do it and then it tells you where the documentation is. So if the author of this who in this case is Cornelius Wag, presumably. Um, <coughs> put up documentation, then we can go see that documentation in the link. But let's play with it a little bit, because, you know, why not? I trust Cornelius, he's a good dude. Or person, I should say. I don't know if he's a dude or not. Wow, this really is get all. So this is getting every resource that is defined inside the cluster, whether built-in or otherwise. And we can, of course, pass uh, sub-arguments, right? We can do uh, get all help, and we can see some of the examples. So they've got get all exclude, get all since one minute. Oh, that's interesting. So that should come back empty for me, but let's try that out. Nice. Get all 
create service test. The TCP equals a okay. and then if we do that again. Nice. That's really cool. Okay, so we can actually do since one minute, we can see what has changed inside of our cluster. And this is actually kind of a telling thing, right? So we're on a 118 cluster, so we got the service defined as you would expect. We also got the endpoints defined, which is currently empty. And then we have the endpoint slice defined also. So that's actually all pretty cool stuff. Yeah, kubectl get all doesn't get all. Um, but what does it actually get? You know, I remember like looking this up once and it's actually at the time when it when get all was defined it kind of was all, but it's it really isn't all. So like if we do kubectl get all in the in the in the in the default namespace, this is what kubectl get all is going to expose. It shows me the service, Kubernetes service, and it shows me the test service. And if I do kubectl get all dash n default, that shows me quite a different output. So comparatively, like to, to your to your point, Nolan, um, the difference between these things are very different. And this is a great example of when or why to use um, kubectl plugins for this sort of stuff, right? Obviously, people have been fighting the battle that kubectl get all doesn't do what it says on the tin for quite some time upstream and. Uh, I would say that it's not likely to be fixed anytime soon. But as long as you have the ability to actually code this in to a binary and and, uh, and manage that part of it, then we could absolutely do it from that perspective, right? Like we could actually have a plugin that gets created and join it and, and join it in that way. Reason for that is all is an API category. Yeah, that's what it is. Thank you. If you add your CRD to all, it would work. But many oh that's a kind of a cool hack but many core apis don't add themselves to all and it seems like they are unlikely to uh, at any time anytime soon so what is another plugin that y'all are interested in exploring uh, one of the other ones i was curious about was rbac lookup and rbac view so let's check that one out and actually what's that ui one based what's the ui based one crew install so here is our cube kettle get all piece. and our crew piece so the way they're handling the way that crew handles this is it actually links it into cube kettle dash rather than actually requiring that the binary that gets pulled down be named anything in specific it's basically just kind of linking it in, which is a pretty cool trick. If you want an interesting plugin to explore how it works, take a look at Node Admin. That's a plugin? Let's see. kubectl crew search node admin. List nodes and run privileged pod with truth. What are you doing to me, Rory? Am I gonna? Am I gonna regret doing this? Let's try it. I, I know Rory. He wouldn't take me on too much of a a journey here. Cube Funk by Denisla. Let's just take a look at the documentation for kicks. So this one. Explores how to actually install it if you want to do it in specific. Very little detail as far as like what's actually happening. We've got some functions defined. Pretty wild. QADM download. You don't need to do this anymore. You can just use get, which is nice. 
Okay, what are we doing? What am I looking at here, Rory? Cube kettle. Mm. That's the unfortunate part. Node admin. Help. One. Ha! Okay. I see. Okay, that makes sense. This is actually going to be very similar to my own little hack, but kubectl get pods. Yeah. Kubectl describe. All right. <coughs> so, this is a pod not a deployment. You can tell because there's in the pod name there's no um, there's no hash, right? It just says no node admin. Um, it's one of the quickest ways to tell. It's not the only way. Inside of here we've populated the node name, presumably, to point at whatever node we chose as the there you go, kind control plane. So in the menu it asked me which node I wanted to target. And then it threw me into the node. So now if I do um, postname, cat etsy, lsb release. Yeah, I'm actually intruded right into the node. And then if I do ip adder, yeah, this is a complete, this gives me a complete way of getting in. So if you're like in uh, AWS or GCP or something like that, and you were like trying to get access on a host uh, without having to SSH in. This is one of the ways to do this. I do this in a different way. I have a thing called KH root, which does it almost exactly this, um, which is pretty clever. So yeah, you've probably seen me talk about KH root before. And then it gets deleted after you. So the sniff plugin is amazing. What else do we have? Look at the collection of plugins. This looks to be a collection of plugins repo. I know it, that's what it looks to be, but it doesn't seem to be exposing them in that way. So let's go into that path again and take a look. So vim kubectl node admin. So it does a function of listing nodes. And then here is the manifest that, oh, it's setting affinity to get there. Interesting. This is the hard way to go about this. because you could just populate node name. The problem with affinity is that, if, is that, is that, is that it would allow for um, scheduling to be a boundary here. In my example, I'm just using, um, I just set the node name field to this. What else is happening? So yeah, it basically just does, it restart, it creates this pod manifest and sets it to de be deleted when it's done. This is the uh, this is the example I'm talking about. Uh, this is my very own uh, node admin plugin function, and it basically does exactly the same thing. I'm using kubectl run to do it. And I'm passing, I'm taking as an argument the first value. And then, so I, I presume that you're going to pass me the name um, of the, the, the node as the first argument. And it will basically do almost exactly the same thing as node admin. So pretty cool tool. Good for diagnostics. Kind of scary from a security perspective. Thank you, Rory. Let's take a look at RBAC lookup. Crew install. Do I have crew? Kubectl crew install RBAC lookup. What, my little one liner? It's on Twitter. I don't get up. Or are you talking about cube functions? I think I actually did put cube functions on there. Kubectl RBAC lookup.
what is this doing? This is looking at the... What is our back? Reactive Ops. Oh, by Fairwinds Ops. Same thing folks, same folks that did the, uh, the Pluto thing we were just talking about. So if I do keep it all R back, look up. Uh, help. Dash K. Ah, this is showing the association with a subject. Ah, that's actually pretty interesting. So in this case, it's pulling back. It's wow, that's really kind of an intense thing. Let's see how this works. Store, our back lookup. It is a go binary. Here's the help output. Oh, neat. That is a cool thing. So you can look up by user, what access they have, like what, what, like where in all of the um, RBAC uh, bindings, uh, cluster role bindings or regular bindings, um, that particular user shows up in the list, the subject list. And in that way you could actually uh, identify what a user by that subject name has access to the cluster, has access to within the cluster, at least from the perspective of um, of how RBAC is configured. It's kind of an interesting one. I, I really dig this actually. And here's why, right? So if I did kubectl um, create cluster role binding view, uh, let's see, default view cluster role view. Service count equals default. Default. And then we'll also give them admin. We'll make two different RBAC statements or two different two different bindings. And then we will do so this output tells me exactly where I'm providing access to roles to a particular subject and that is a killer output. This output on the other hand, off can I list as, or actually as system service account default default tells me a different thing. This tells me uh, of the aggregated permissions for that particular user, system service account default default, what can they do, right? And so you can tell that in this case, there's very little that, um, oh, that's really interesting. Anyway, um, This view shows me what this particular service account can do um, inside, of the, inside of the cluster with the permissions that have been granted them, but it does not describe how those permissions were granted them, right? So that view role, um, maybe not, may, maybe like uh, somewhat um, extraneous, right? Because obviously I've given them, I've given them an admin view, and I've also given and I've also given them view, and everything. And this is a view is a subset of admin, but I wouldn't know that, right? I wouldn't know that they that they conflict like that. So that's pretty wild. How are you doing, Mr. Joe? Good to see you. I have an idea of pulling Joe into the session, if you're down. But 
<coughs> um, but yeah, we're just kind of exploring the different plugins and seeing what's out there and kind of taking it easy this episode. Uh, we're looking at RBAC Lookup, which is a really cool tool for showing us the um, the different ro the relationship between subjects and roles that have been granted to those subjects cluster wide. So that's actually a very cool one. Do you want to? Um, I was thinking one of the things we could do, Joe, if you're interested in it, is I could have you. Um, Yeah, we've looked at some of the undercover stuff, exactly. So, the first one that we showed actually was a, was a bash one, which is neat because it, it indicates that, like, obviously it doesn't matter what language you want to write your, your plugin in, it can be bash, it can be Python, it could be, well, Python may be a little trickier, but, like, it can be bash, as long as it's portable, right? So you have a bash script or you have a, a, a Go binary, what have you. As long as it's an executable and you can kind of assume that it will work in most of the in most of the target environments, then you're in good shape. Shout out to Go for being really awesome about that. But yeah, like I imagine the kubectl plugin game isn't super strong in Windows. Joe, would you be would you be down to join a um, a Zoom and share uh, and, and and dig into one with me? Does that sound interesting? All right, let's try this out. Um, <coughs> I'm going to flip to the face for a second. Two. I'll shift two. I'm going to prove to myself that I'm on face. Control shift two. All right, cool. Face. All right, so let's get this set up for Mr. Joe here real quick. actually kind of curious we're gonna just try some something live here and see what happens I think it'd be awesome to pull Joe into this I know that he was also really looking forward to it mr. Joe beta you should be able to see my link in the chat senor there he is all right so I'm going to try to, uh, let me see if I can hear you. Can I hear you? Unmute. The audio part might be interesting, but let's see what happens. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can, I can. Yes. Am I coming through? Yep. You're sounding okay. So let's see if we can make this happen. That'll be really cool. Um, I had a feedback loop there. Sorry. Oh, no problem. So. I need to change my background. Here, let's do a... Can you all hear Joe? Can you all hear Joe out there? Can Joe say can something? Me? Hello? Oh. Joe's oh, quiet yeah. as the stream is probably coming. What about do, um, how about that? Can you hear Joe better now?
check. And my microphone's back on. All right. That was like the hardest loop I've ever seen. That was completely nuts. So basically, like, I even removed all of the audio um, from the sec from the from the loop, and it still wasn't able to actually get right. So that was pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> all right, turning up my sound. So I think that we're just going to explore this next week. I thought it would be worth to try, but uh, sadly, it doesn't look like it is. All right, can you all hear me better now? And we're back, no feedback. That was completely nuts, and I, I apologize sincerely to everyone who was wearing headphones when that happened. FaceTime on your phone and hold up your phone to the webcam. That's a possibility. Joe was a tad quiet, so maybe if I, well, do you want to try it again, or do you want to call it? What do you think? Do you want to try it again? Will you be down to try it again, Joe? Check. My audio should be okay now. I should be I should be alright, I think. Analog stereo output, yeah, should be good. Try it before we could hear him, but that was before I did my crazy loopback thing. So let me just make sure that's not happening anymore. Uh, control shift M or Windows Shift M. All right, and then let me kick back to the screen face. And then we'll go over here and we'll do new meeting. Let me just try one more time. It's kind of fun to kind of explore this stuff. It's, that's the point of TGIK is to play with this stuff live, right? And so like, I'm having a good time. I hope that, I hope that this makes sense. Control shift. I think I know how to make you sound better, Joe. I think I can make it I think I can make it work. Let me know when you're there. There will not be feedback. I, apo I apologize for that. Are you there? Not yet. I can't. Have, I have no audio coming from you. Uh, but the, yeah, I can hear you just barely, though. Can you turn your mic up? Okay. Give me one second. Let me get my output device turned up a little bit. Hello, hello. Control shift three. Can you hear? Can you hear Joe? I think I need a better speaker because unfortunately it looks like my, my my laptop speaker is just not doing a terribly good job of getting sound out and so I'd have to loop the I'd have to take my input off and make it so the input was coming from the output of the zoom but there is Joe at least he's here with us saying hello and we've learned some interesting stuff on a Mac you can create a virtual yeah exactly that would be the next part I need to explore there is something similar to black hole to Soundflower. Um, On, on PA Linux, I can, on the Pavo Control Mixer, I can do something similar. But I'd, I don't want to get too creative either, because I feel like we've already had that experience. I mean, at least we get to see like your your face. Welcome back from your meetings. I'm glad you're there, at least. Um, but I think that we're gonna yeah get back into it a little more. I'll play with it this week. 
And next week we will try to do this again, but like with an actual Joe and an actual Duffy. And we're gonna get this working because we really, really want to see if there's a way for us to do like co-hosting. Um, and you don't have the audio for me from you can right and it sounds so simple and i've been burned by that just now with the whole feedback thing what i was what i did earlier uh to try and make this loop is in in uh, pulse audio you have a loopback device and you can actually make it so that the two different inputs go to the same output but i think what i need to do is create a virtual device and have my input and and my uh application input go to that same virtual device and then have obs take that device which is not something I'm I'm gonna explore live, I don't think. Um, so. so we talked about that plugged in. We talked about that plug in. What else did we want to explore? Let's see what y'all are looking at. You are looking at my screen. Cool. All right. So I'm it. <coughs> Capturing desktop audio with the opia. Yeah, it can be tricky. The screen is blurry. The screen is blurry, Rada, because probably because I had just reconnected to the stream. And so if you look at the bottom right hand corner down, I guess it would probably be down there, down there, one of the two, there'll be a little gear icon and you can select that gear icon and pick a better resolution. But anytime I stop my stream and reconnect, it seems that YouTube has this thing where it like drops your, it drops the quality of the thing that you're watching down pretty hard. And that's, that's unfortunate. Um, interesting issues, cu custom plugin indexes. This was, a inter this was an interesting issue from Ahmet. Oh, actually against crew, so that's a good one. This is talking about what if you could actually add different, um, different indexes. Like right now I think you can use crew to do search in info, upgrade and list and that sort of stuff. But I guess what if you would want to, what if you wanted to host your own index? This is where I would love to be able to have like Amit be a part of it too, right? Or like any of y'all, like it would be great to like kind of, ex kind of expand our, our, our ability to kind of bring more people in and kind of explore some of this stuff live. But what else do we have? Anybody else interested in a different plugin or where do y'all think we should go next? Cause I was gonna look at some more plugins myself here. So let's, let's get into that. Interesting introduction to plugin development. If you're looking at some interesting ones, consider the CLI runtime. Look at the sample CLI. Let's actually, let's go play with that. That'll be fun. So this is actually available online. It's called the, the sample CLI plugin and it looks like what they're gonna do. This repository implements a single kubectl plugin for switching the namespace that the current cube config context points to. with this that sounds good to everybody should we like try to hack a tra hack a um a plug for this access matrix will it work in openshift Assume yes. Because it looks like it's actually going to hit the, I mean, so if anything, uh, OpenShift is a superset um, of Kubernetes itself. So what this is exposing is actually the relationship between things inside of uh, leveraging our back inside of Kubernetes itself. And so because uh, OpenShift represents a superset of that, like all of the included stuff and some other things that are OpenShift specific, that I would expect you would at least get useful output from those things that are known about in RBAC. Um, so interesting question. What else do we get? More discoverable kubectl plugins lists.
Oh, nice. Oh, but it doesn't. Look, it actually told me, um, because I remember we, when we were hacking about this, uh, Joe, one of the things that we were exploring was this little, this tool that, um, that Brad pointed out, which was in my local bin directory. And it's if you do cube kettle uh, honk, um, which is what it was originally called. And then I just basically renamed it to cube kettle config. And that way <coughs> we could try it out and see if it, and see how it would, see how it was actually working. But it's pointing out that like any of these plugins have access to like everything that you have access to. And so you have to kind of be aware a little bit more careful about like, you know, what plugins you're operating. And it's actually even part of the output of crew, which again, shout out to Ahmet for like, I'm, I'm for, for making sure that, I mean, for putting that in there, that's awesome. Um, but the, what was interesting about the output of kubectl crew list plugin list is it lists all the plugins that are available in the system. So I have a kubectl vSphere plugin for my uh, TKG for my TKG interactions with the um, uh, TKG vSphere stuff. So basically leveraging um, Cooper, <coughs> the, the, uh, the VMware hypervisor, the vSphere as a hypervisor, directly as a kubelet and, and kind of working through that stuff. There's a lot that we've been talking about there. It's actually a project called Project Pacific. And if you're interested in learning more about it, there's like a lot of really great resources online. <coughs> but this is a plugin that we ship as part of that, which allows us to authenticate to the cluster using um, vSphere primitives. And so you can kind of authenticate as uh, a regular uh, vSphere user. And this, and this ties in that piece of it, which is actually pretty cool. But it's listing all of the plugins that are known, right? So here's the links to plugins that have been installed just recently. And it actually throws a warning, which is not completely accurate, but it says kubectl config overrides existing command kubectl config, right? I would say, uh, I, w I don't think that this overrides it, overwrites it, but it does uh, conflict with it. So perhaps like conflict would be a better term, but regardless, that's a good point. View utilization. You know, somebody was actually just pointing this, pointing out the need for utilization resources. So that's actually kind of a good point. Let's bring that one up and take a look at how it works. One of the things I wanted to show here, I don't know if it's possible. So this is the get aha. See crew. Store. Get all. Get. Ah, dang it. All right, so this is what I wanted to see. Ah, interesting. So this is actually probably not as interesting as I was hoping it would be. What I was trying to figure out is like, one of the questions I had for plugins, and this is actually something that might be interesting to hear back. Shattering commands is a feature and a danger, but it doesn't actually allow you to shadow them. Uh, in fact, the precedence is going to always be the built-in, not the not the shadowed one. Sandbox to some degree, that would be cool. I think that the way to do that would be to actually run it as, I mean, in some form of container, uh, whether you run it as a Docker container or, or some way like that. So one of the questions I had when thinking about plugins was like, how can you extend the authentication mechanism that kubectl has into the plugin? But then I was realizing that I was thinking about this wrong. Um, and that fundamentally the permission happens before the plugin starts. Is that right, Ahmet? Or do, you ha do we have any feedback on that one? I'm curious how that would work. So like in this example, 
what's happening is that when you call the function that is a part of this plugin, list nodes or kubectl node admin, then <coughs> um, this function is actually going to make use of the uh, the kubectl command directly. So it's kind of looping itself back over itself, right? It wouldn't be, I mean, it would be hard to sandbox all plugins, but some, some plugins might be interesting. Most plugins either use, either shell out to kubectl or use client go. So plugins don't have a custom auth mechanism. I guess client go would just Re, would just be would reinstantiate would be re instantiating the existing cube config so basically restarting the the config in go let's try let's take a look at that so go get git.k it's the io sample CLI plugin so this is the sample plugin let's just take a look at how this is built and build it ourselves and play with it a bit and so oh, go get it as see this is actually something i've run into a few times and so i'll take a second to call this out um, obviously this is a git repository it may be intuitive to you to think that you could just do go get and then call out the the path right um k8 stuck or <coughs> you would be able to do go get GitHub Kubernetes sample CLI plugin. But that won't work. And it's actually very smart of them to call this out here down below. Like note, if you're going to vendor or go get this package, you're going to want to get it from this particular path. And this is actually part of kind of like the vanity URL stuff that, um, that uh, Go can actually support. So if you're interested in that, that okay, it's kind of an interesting topic. So. Let's go ahead and kick this up. Let's play with this sample plugin. Browsers. This sample plugin has some modules to pull in. Wow, it's pulling in an influx DB, it's pulling in all kinds of interesting stuff. The sample repo is super cool because it uses the generic CLI options package. So your plugin will support the same flags and end bars as kubectl. Namespace context token ignore. Oh, that's interesting. Sigh. This is probably broken on master, so let's just try V0182. So what I've just done there, when you do a go get, a part of that go get is actually to do a, a git checkout of, well, it's still broken. I wonder when the last time this worked was. Um, was to, was to, is to do a go, uh, uh, no, it's still broken. What's happening there? What was required as, I, well, we might be able to fix that one. Go on.
version was the before. Actually, I think I have these arguments backwards. But let's try it anyway and see what happens. Windy out here. So part of that change is probably like a, 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 a facing change on the on the on behalf of like uh, the way that Core OS, um, SED is now part of SEDIO, its own kind of its own GitHub org, and so part of that means that it's probably just recently made a change that it's no longer available at the old repo, but it's only available at the new repo, and one of my dependencies inher inherits it differently than the way it is currently described. So if we were to go uh, if we were to go look at the way that the um, etcd repository is set up inside of GitHub, it likely requires that you import or uh, import it using that new name rather than the old name. Which makes me also wonder if we're going to get beat up on that in the um, in the Kubernetes repo because there's obviously there's a in the API server we actually vendor in etcd as well, so it's actually kind of an interesting interesting change I wasn't expecting to see. Wow, this is crazy town. Look how much stuff it's pulling in. Downloading the internet. <laughs> exactly, man. Like, crazy town. All right. Go etcd IO Bbolt. Used for two different module paths. Hmm. I don't think I can change that though, because that's actually going to be part of one of my dependencies. So let's take a look at that. Real quick. So this is the actual code that I'm running, and you can see it's so simple. It's such a simple thing. I'm pulling in the CLI runtime, I'm pulling in the CLI plugin com package command, and I'm pulling in OS and then GitHub SPF P flag. Maybe I'm actually building too much. Let's go into CMD. Go. I am. To kettle NS. To kettle NS. To. Let's 
spin, two kettle, and F. Nice. Dash dash list. Not so good. Kettle, and F dash dash list. Aha. All right, we're getting somewhere. Let's take a look at how this thing works. <coughs> so this thing is pulling in P flag. It's pulling in the generic CLI op options and the sample CNI plugin from the KA3 repo. Basically, it's kind of an example implementation of itself. It sets flags for a new flag set for QBNS. And pulling in the options from there. And then it says new command namespace, generic CLI, streams, in and out. And then if we go into the package here, this is where things are actually going to get kind of interesting because it's doing, wow, this is quite a pro pretty full featured example. So Pulling in the client command and the client command API and the generic CLI options. View the current namespace and an NS list. So what if we do that? Let's do kubectl NS list. It doesn't seem to be working correctly. It's whatever it's using for discovery. It seems to only know about it once it's actually once it's actually been there. So I mean, I gotta say, I like the sample experience, but you know, nothing's really gonna beat the K KCTX or KubeCTX uh, uh, experience. So let's like, like I'm pointing out really that like Ahmet is a rock star for lots of reasons, and so shout out to him because like he also wrote. Um, X. And recently rewrote it in Go. <coughs> so if you're interested in like trying out the the, um, the Go rewrite, I don't think this is actually part of like the way that um, KubeCTX is exposed today, like uh, automatically through install. But if you wanted to try this out and play with it, I'm actually running this one myself. Um, but now it used to be Bash, and now it is Go. So definitely check it out and give feedback on that. Another thing that Ahmet has written that I have found incredibly helpful. Is this network policies repo? Um, and I don't mean to say that like it's only Ahmet doing this work, because I'm sure that he would catch me out on that. It is a bunch of people doing it, but like incredible, incredible uh, amount of like really incredibly relevant things that I've seen uh, come from Ahmet over the years. So this Kubernetes network policies repo is also tremendous. Like if you're trying to understand network policy inside of Kubernetes, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, it's been tremendous. So, I mean, it's great to see like all the work from Ahmet and, and the community surrounding him, you know, like it's tremendous. I've opened issues on a number of different repos and he's always been very responsive and, and just great. So shout out to Ahmet for all of the work, including on, on crew and network policy, kubectx and all the things that are not top of my head, which include a ton of things, all of your speaking engagements. It's really, I'm just grateful to have you around. Um, well, I think, uh, what else do we have in the chat? Is there anybody else that wants to explore things? Octant does a thing where it has a local cache API to its plugins. That might be interesting to amortize the cost of that. Having that in the cluster. It's super cool because it uses the generic options package, which means you can take arguments, which I didn't see or play with. It is about 2.40 though, so I think I might just start my weekend here pretty soon. Oh, the 116 tag works. Interesting. Oh, because it'll tie, it'll pull in the previous 116 stuff. 
but I got that working. I got it working on one eight on one eighteen one, so that was good. Killer Grafana features on the hub for current utilizations. That is kind of neat. I should check that one out. I'm very much looking to seeing that article, Steve. I'd love to see how Metal does SCD. It's actually kind of a follow-on of the chat that we did before on SCD. And I do plan on doing a second one of those, so stay tuned for that. That'll come in soon. And let's take a look at the YAML plugin manifest. I'm curious if you hear criticism around that. The YAML plugin manifest. Oh, I see. Okay. This is the current version that you have, I think, and a mapping. Are these the manifests that you're talking about, Amit? Yeah, other plugins probably have more complex ones. Okay, so inside of your .crew directory, you have four direct, you have four sections, and this is actually, I guess, how crew is working. Um, and we've looked at a little bit, looked at this a little bit before, right? So if you go into the bin directory, you can see the sim links that crew manages for, on your behalf, and that way, the binary that it's pulling down uh, when you do get all, for example, doesn't have to be the, this doesn't have to be the name of the binary. It could be linked in. So if I were to do ls minus al for kubectl get all, I can see that this is linking um, to this particular binary that was pulled in for my for my system. <coughs> and if we look at the index, this is actually what I was just noticing. If we do git um, git remote dash v. This is a checkout, a local checkout of the master branch on um, on the crew index, right? So you can actually go check that out. Sigs.kh.io crew index. So this is where the index is coming from. So all of the plugins that are known about are coming from here. And I believe that is covered in crew um, that you can actually, <coughs> like when you want to actually register a plugin, so you write, you, you write one and you're interested in um, putting one up, how you go about submitting plugins to crew if you wanted to actually add it to the crew index. It's a pull request against that. They obviously recommend that if you're going to write a plugin to solve some specific problem, try to make it like you know generally usable, and um, follow the crew plugin naming guide. You can't use the you can't override or shadow some of the um, arguments that kubectl already listens to. Is there a requirement that crew uh, that plug yeah there would be have to, there would be a requirement that crew plugins have a unique name right there has to be some uniqueness constraint. Because they're all in here, right? So you can't like over, you can't define uh, two of the same name. However, nothing keeps you from uh, conflicting with that and having your own repo. You just wouldn't be able to contribute it to the crew index. And then if we look at like the plugin for um, access matrix here, 
this is the manifest that is being generated for this one. This is a, it's a versioned manifest, which is interesting. I wonder how many of these are out of like are, are you know within the same uh, particular version. Like if everybody's using V1 Alpha 2 or if there are multiple. But then we have the different versions of the resource that have been defined, right? So here's the access matrix one that we pulled in. I think if we don't specify, it just grabs the most recent. And then it's also tying in match labels OS. So whether it's an whether the OS is Darwin, Windows, or Mac, if you are building that binary for each of these, then it, there's some intelligence built in to determine which one to grab for you. That's actually pretty cool. And it's on apparently it's on the developer to define to define this manifest, which would be good because the developer knows where these things are. There's your description. That's really neat. What is CSSH? What? What? So you get a tarball. It has a checksum. The binary is kubectl CSSH. This is where the link's going to happen. Files from How does that one work? Let's try that out. I was about to wrap it up, but now I got all caught up in this other thing. So here is the verbose output, also tremendously awesome. So in ensuring that particular directories exist, it found 90 m it found 90 plugins in the output. Updating the local copy of the plugin index, making sure that we're still on master and that there's not a more updated version. <coughs> Interesting resetting up resetting so like if somebody were to like manipulate the content of that plugin directory we would actually force the overwrite of it then we pop into the receipts directory and we populate and we see what's there and then we read the plugin and then we see that it's not there and then we start about installing it so it created a temp directory it pulled that con the the tarball into that temp directory. This is very well annotated. Great stuff. The log is tremendously useful. Compares the checksum with the signed version of that piece, so at least we know that the one that is up that we pulled down from the repository is the one that the the um, the author of the package said it would be. Hasn't changed in size or content. We pull the tarball down, we, ex we explode the tarball. Now what is that doing? Because we called out parse args.sh as part of the policy piece, it's created a store. Ah, I see. Neat. So then if we go into our store directory, Yes, okay. So as part of processing this, in our manifest we specified, um, where'd it go? In our manifest we specified that we wanted to process the license file, 
we wanted to process the cube CSSH file and we wanted to process the parse args file. The tarball might own might contain significantly more than that, but these are the three files that we want to have stored inside of that path. And so these are the three things that were just exposed directly from that tarball. That's actually kind of a cool implementation. And then, of course, in our path, because of the app name, we have kubectl cth, or cssh, and if we do ls-al, we can see that that is pointing to also kubectl cssh. Nice. Nice. Okay. Well, obviously, I'm using a kind cluster, which doesn't have, uh, isn't listening on SSH, <laughs> so this is not going to be useful to me. But very cool stuff. Yeah, that is really neat. All right. Well, that's all I'm going to time. Uh, all I have time to explore today. So I wanted to say thank you very much for um, being here. Um, I look forward and know that it's important to us and to uh, to kind of exploring more of like a way of collaborating on some of these things. So it would be great to see, like Joe and I get in there and like explore some project. It would be great to see members of the community um, in here kind of exploring some stuff with us. Like for this one with Amit, I would love to actually have Amit like here with us exploring this stuff. And so um, thank you so, so much for all of your engagement. Have a great weekend and um, I'll see you all next time. So thanks again. <laughs>